All right, good morning. It's so cold this morning. I love it, right? Uh, like, not even 70 my kind of weather right I'll take it while it lasts. Uh, and Halloween is what six days. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. wild, right? I can't believe it. I uh, I was looking at this big like plastic pumpkin that was like great candy, and I couldn't find it this morning. I was like, that's not okay. So I brought some candy because I will see you Monday, right? And I <laughs> I was not weird bringing candy at 8 30, but like it's not that. I mean, I've already had some, so you're in the clear, but I won't see you Monday because we have our exam, right? Um, and I wanted it to be Monday because I did not want it to be on Wednesday, so like the day after Halloween would just be cruel because it'd be so candy hungover, of course. <laughs> Only candy uh, of all things, but I did bring some candy. I'll pass it around, like some, and if you want it for later, that's fine too. I wish it was in my pumpkin, but at least it's in something, right? Uh, so since I won't see you Monday, I do hope you all have a good Halloween and have fun. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, stealing all my kids' candy on Halloween. But I got to be a good parent and like make sure it's safe. So that's my thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm very considerate like that. Uh, so our exam will be on uh, Monday. It's exam number two. Uh, and so just like the first exam, make sure you use the study guide. Make sure that you're preparing and that you're studying. You can use everything on the exam. It's on Canvas. So we won't meet in person. It'll open at 12, like in the morning on Monday, and then it'll close just before midnight. So uh, you could take it at any time. Obviously, you have this time free to take it, but um, if you would rather sleep in, you can take it a little bit later, and that's totally fine. Just make sure you take it before the end of the day because it will close, and then it'll be too late, okay? Uh, there's a study guide, of course, on Canvas. It's on the chapter since the last exam. So it's not cumulative, and there are no diagrams in this one. So I think uh, in a sense that makes it a little bit a little bit easier. Uh, any questions about the exam? Anything question-wise? All right. So when I see you next after today, it'll be November. Just let that one sink in. Right. Uh, it always seems to go so fast. The second we hit November, it just it seems to uh, to fly from there. But we'll enjoy these last days of October. We get to talk about um, sexual expression, arousal and response today. So we'll look at what are some of the factors that influence someone being interested in sex and uh, uh, levels of arousal, um, things like aphrodisiacs and anaphrodisiacs. And then some um, kind of behaviors and, and things related to that. So um, that will be our our topic for today. And then this will obviously be on, on the exam, right? That you'll take on, on Monday. So um, I have this quote I wanna read to you and it was from your textbook, but I think it's kind of a, a nice way to start thinking about all the factors that can go into whether or not somebody is interested in sex. And there's a lot of motivations behind like physical intimacy with someone. So sex, can be motivated by excitement or boredom, physical need or affection, desire or duty, loneliness or complacency. It can be a bid for power, an egalitarian exchange, a purely mechanical release of tension, or a highly emotional fusion, a way to wear oneself out for sleep, or a way to revitalize oneself. Sex can be granted as a reward or inducement, an altruistic offering or a favor. It can also be an act of selfishness, insecurity, or narcissism. Sex can express almost anything and mean almost anything, right? And so just the number of factors involved in those choices to be intimate with somebody, uh, there are so many. And so what we'll look at are what are some of the things that might uh, play a role in somebody's level of arousal, level of interest in sex and sexuality. And obviously hormones play a huge role in that. And we've been talking about hormones all semester, right? But the androgens, the estrogens, and oxytocin are three big like hormonal um, culprits in a sense, right? So the androgens are things like testosterone. And testosterone is thought to play a huge part 
in the level of like arousal and interest that people have in sex. And this is one of the reasons why we think that maybe men are stereotypically more interested in sex than women because they have more testosterone. Now that might not always be the case, but that is one kind of theory behind that. The estrogens can obviously play a role as well. And we've talked about oxytocin a few times, really like fascinating um, hormone that plays a role in our like um, responses to being close to somebody, in our levels of attraction, all sorts of different things. And uh, I was watching the, I'm a huge supernatural actual fan. I don't know if any of you watched that show. It's like gone now, but uh, we've rewatched it like three times, I think, in all the years that it's been around. And there was a clip in there um, about oxytocin, which I, I got like way too excited about. So I recorded it to share with you. Uh, it was a, kind of an interesting take. They had like people who were sirens and the way that they attracted people was in using oxytocin. I was like, oh, I like that. That's kind of creative. So um, let me play this for you. It's brief, but um, I thought it was kind of a cool like connection to what we were talking about and oxytocin to try and attract people, which I thought was kind of an interesting take. It's obviously not something that you can do, uh, but talking a little bit about you know, what this hormone does again, it's that love hormone released during orgasm and cuddling, and it does play a role in attraction, right? So uh, anytime there's a, a pop culture reference, it's always nice. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. That's so funny. I, I actually saw that yesterday. Uh, we were watching TikTok. It was last night and I saw it on there and laughed. And then I tried to find the video again. It couldn't. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously it's a hormone. So it's nothing like synthetic. It's nothing you can sell or market. Uh, we're going to talk about aphrodisiac soon. But sadly, there aren't things like that that work, at least not yet. I mean, I can see how maybe one day we'll get there. But uh, that's more marketing and a cool idea than than a reality but, but I, I did see that as well it's kind of funny it was a roll-on right like yeah. if I'm... yeah say that one more time I'm sorry like, like, <clears throat> you know you know how like you know <laughs> I don't you're gonna have to say a little like, more okay. <laughs> you know? Well, I don't know. Like, is there a drug you take that like gives you like? Oh, okay. Uh, not necessarily, right? So you can have it released through any kind of like physical contact with another person, but there isn't necessarily a way to like synthetically create it yet, right? Uh, it wouldn't shock me if one day we get there, but we don't have that um, as of now, right? And we have tons of substances that people think will do it. But none of them actually do. It's more of like an expectation, like a placebo effect kind of thing. I don't know what that means. Yeah. When I was doing a homework assignment yeah. to the sex store, nice. There was like a a drink there. It's called an aphrodisiac. Yeah. So is that just like a made up thing, or does it actually do something? It probably has a lot of. I would assume it's very similar to like an energy drink, if anything. Um, I mean, I'd have to like look at the ingredients. But oftentimes what happens is those things are, they give you like energy, which can make you have like the drive to be more interested. But yeah, there's nothing at the moment that actually creates like an interest in, in sex. There's it's lots like of a, products that they try to market, but none of them have been like scientifically shown to increase sex drive, sadly. Could it be like a placebo effect? Yeah. Thing? Oh, for sure. So you give somebody something that is known as an aphrodisiac. And they might all of a sudden find themselves quite interested that that's totally a placebo effect, like the role of, of expectation. And that's very strong for people. So that might be why the stereotype of aphrodisiacs have persisted as long as they have, because there's so much of that expectation of it's going to help, it's going to work. Uh, and that can be enough for a lot of people. Like our manner is so powerful, right? And so our expectations and thoughts can be more powerful than a drug at times, for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Make them like more sexual. Yeah. Yeah. So same thing. So chocolate contains trace levels of, of phenylethylamine. Remember when we were in uh, chapter seven, like PEA or phenylethylamine is something that plays a role in arousal. Um, it is like a natural aphrodisiac, and so there are trace levels of it in chocolate, and so that's where that idea comes from. 
Is it enough to change anything? Probably not. I mean, I don't know, depending on how much chocolate you ate, right? But, uh, but probably not enough to do anything. But um, that's the idea is it contains phenylethylamine or PEA. Um, and so the thought is that it could increase some level of libido, but it, again, not, not enough to matter uh, as a good yeah. Same for oysters. Yeah. Same for oysters. Um, and I believe it's like two or three slides from now is aphrodisiacs. Um, but yeah, oysters and a bunch of like other foods that are deemed aphrodisiacs. Uh, again, expectation more than anything. And so um, since we're talking about, I'll just mention it now, but the idea behind aphrodisiacs is that they come from like rich foods. So the thought was that bland food would curb somebody's sexual desire. Right. And that's something that we used a lot to try and curb masturbation, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but what we got was that like things like, uh, you know, oysters and foods that were expensive and hard to acquire became aphrodisiacs because they were associated with like wealth and luxury. Um, and so this role of expectation came into it. Right. So, yeah, interesting. Uh, we have a lot of those, but none of them, sadly, none of them seem to, to do much. expectation viral as well serotonin uh, interestingly inhibits sexual arousal so um if you've ever like known somebody who's taking an antidepressant for example very common that serotonin selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or ssris um common antidepressants actually increase serotonin so it's really common that they have sexual side effects and that you see that listed a lot of like oh it may cause difficulty becoming aroused it might reduce your um, sex drive so it's interesting that we see some correlates to like some uh, mental health medications here but dopamine serotonin right our mind we can obviously create a lot of arousal with the thoughts that we have uh, which plays a big role in expectation like we were just talking about and then uh, obviously our senses can play a big role as well, right? Touch is really considered to be like the dominant sexual sense, right? Now, obviously uh, other senses play a big role in like our level of arousal, but touch is a big one. And we sometimes divide like dominant zones in our body into two categories. There are primary erogenous zones and secondary erogenous zones. Erogenous just means like it's arousing, right? So when these areas are like stimulated or touched, they tend to be arousing in some way. So primary erogenous zones are naturally arousing because they're very dense in nerve endings. And there are parts of the body that tend to be very like sensitive, right? Like the genitals, the breasts, the anus, thighs, neck, ears, mouth, lips, and so on. Um, all of those places have a lot of nerve endings. So they tend to be sensitive and arousing when like touched in any way. We can also learn to have other parts of the body become arousing through conditioning, interestingly. So a secondary erogenous zone would be a part of the body that maybe you have learned to become um, aroused through. So sometimes we get things like the paraphilias or fetishes that form this way, right? So let's say somebody becomes aroused when their feet are massaged. Their feet would then be an erogenous zone, a secondary you might be like, how does that happen, right? Well, let's say that your partner is like massaging your feet and your legs and then you end up having sex. And that happens again and again, right? You might start to condition yourself that like your feet being touched equals arousal and sexuality. So um, we get this a lot, right? Where maybe somebody is like getting a massage on their back and it becomes arousing and it leads to more. So all of a sudden when their back is touched, they become aroused, right? Um, and that happens through things like conditioning. Uh, pheromones and smell. Pheromones are more of like an animal thing, but there have been some really interesting studies done on pheromones in people um, and looking at attraction. There was a, a famous study done, like, gosh, it's like 20 years ago at this point, where they had a bunch of men wear a white t-shirt and then they took the t-shirts off and they had a bunch of women smell the t-shirts and rate how attractive the men were based on smell. And it was fascinating because what they saw was that the levels of attraction were different at different times of like their menstrual cycle. Um, and they were also different from like uh, 
like from age and so on as well. So there was this interesting correlation between like smell and attraction, uh, more like correlational, but interesting that uh, smell and pheromones can play a role. It does more so in animals, but it can definitely do it in people as well. So we're talking a lot about these aphrodisiacs. Uh, so just to define that and kind of a little bit more here, uh, these are substances that allegedly cause sexual desire, right? Or increase sexual desire uh, for people. And as I mentioned, there's no clear evidence of anything that tends to have a genuine aphrodisiac quality. And so it's really those expectations that play a huge, huge role here. Um, and so we get a lot of that, right? Where people are expecting that it will work. And that can be, again, more powerful than it actually working, right? That role of your mind is huge. And these are named after the Greek goddess of love, Aphrodite. That's where the, the term comes from. Um, and really interesting, like if you look at uh, like the term horny, for example, like if somebody's turned on, sometimes we use the word horny um, to represent that. Um, it comes from the Asian cultural belief that the ground up horns of rhinoceroses and animals could increase sexual desire. So next time somebody says they're horny, that's where it comes from. The horns of the rhinoceros being ground up and given to people uh, was an ancient practice that was done. Um, it was obviously very problematic, right, from an animal rights perspective. But that's where the term horny comes from, just as a, a funny like side note. But there aren't any of these substances that actually work. And I was trying to find a video of this, and I found like a, a clip from like, uh, it was like a British like talk show. But um, they talk about some of the common aphrodisiacs and I, I want to play that for you because I think it's kind of a, a good overview of them but again keep in your mind that these uh aren't things that are actually scientifically validated okay so let me play that just cracks me up um I love this what's what's up <laughs> we're not having a uh, Halloween on the uh, class yeah so you dressed up for me yeah oh I love it that's I cool we have to take a picture uh-huh. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's fun. Right. You walked in and like, oh, I love it. <laughs> I wish that we were all meeting on Halloween. That's like sad to me that we're not meeting on Halloween. You don't want it the day after Halloween. Or like not the next day, but like the next day. Oh, okay. I figured we'll get it out of the way so you can enjoy it. That was my thought. But um, anyway, but uh, so I love that that video kind of goes over those, right? Like rich foods, right? That's where the term comes from. Like again, oysters, chocolate, um, avocados. Hard to unsee that, right? I love avocado. <laughs> it's hard to think that it's uh, named after testicles, but I won't think about that when I eat it, right? But uh, we have tons of things that we think are aphrodisiacs, but again, none of them are proven, but we have a million things that are anaphrodisiacs that we know actually do inhibit sexual desire. And I just mentioned like antidepressants, alcohol is another one. So alcohol, you're like, wait, what? <laughs> I look at look on your face right now. Um, initially, alcohol may, might make somebody less, like have less inhibition. So they're more interested in maybe being close to somebody or having physical intimacy but it plays a big role in inhibiting uh, erections in men. If men drink too much, they oftentimes cannot get an erection, right? Um, and that is a very common thing, especially as men get older. Um, and so it's considered an anaphrodisiac because it can, if they're very inebriated, it can make it where they can't get um, turned on, right? Or can't get an erection to engage in any kind of like sexual activity. Uh, so nicotine, a lot of medications, things like alcohol, antidepressants, blood pressure medication is another one. So we have lots of things like that. Uh, now, sometimes people ask, well, what about drugs like Viagra and stuff like that? It doesn't increase your sex drive. All it does is increase your ability to get things like an erection. Okay, so it doesn't actually increase arousal as much as it increases blood flow to make an erection easier. So uh, interesting that just a lot of role of expectations here and, and not a lot of like things that are actually proven. Lots of ones that are proven to stop it, but not to uh, increase sexual. Any other like thoughts or comments or questions or anything here? Uh, a little bit about sexual response. Uh, remember we talked about Masters and Johnson? Chapter two feels so far away, right? Back when we did that uh, research experiment out on the 
campus, right? That feels like a long time ago at this point. Uh, but Masters and Johnson, those two researchers uh, that recorded people having sex, uh, were really well known for coining like the phases of sexual response. All of that research that they did allowed them to see how men and women respond physically when they're aroused. And so what we notice is that there are kind of two things that are happening when people are turned on, right? When they're aroused, we see something called vasocongestion and something called myotonia. And those are two processes that occur in people as they're becoming aroused and go through these different phases. So vasocongestion is when your blood vessels engorge or fill with blood, right? Um, and this is in response to arousal. Very common that when people are turned on, they get what's called a sex flush or a sex rash. It's not a rash, it's more of a flush. Um, on their chest up here, their whole chest can turn like a bright red color. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of blood flow from arousal, right? And it tends to go away like pretty quickly. It's not something that lasts. And then we also see that muscle tension tends to build and go through different parts of the body when we're aroused as well. So Masters and Johnson, through their research, um, coined four different stages. The first stage is called excitement, right? Where we are getting turned on. This could be maybe like when you're engaging in some kind of like foreplay activity or things before sex. Now this is very driven toward like, uh, like coitus or like male female intercourse. Uh, but uh, sex flush again being common here, you see a building in that like um, blood flow, right? That is starting to build up. When people are engaging in like sexual activity, like they said, the majority of that we would call plateau. So that's kind of like when you're engaging in like a sex act or some kind of intimacy, which hopefully um, leads to orgasm, right? Which would be like that peak or moment of, of release. Um, so this would be like an ejaculation in men or women. Women can ejaculate as well, like a clear fluid. Uh, they talked a lot about the Grafenberg spot. No one ever calls it the Grafenberg spot, but that's the technical name after the doctor who uh, coined it or the G spot uh, being a very common uh, kind of source of stimulation for women to cause orgasm. Um, and then resolution would be the phase where your body kind of is returning back to normal. Now, interestingly, uh, very different patterns between men and women when we talk about like how we respond sexually. And I have a picture on the next page of that. But men undergo what's called a refractory period. Now, when men are young, the refractory period might be seconds to minutes. But when men are like quite a bit older, um, it can be days, hours to days, depending on the person. A refractory period is something that only men experience, but it's a period of time where they cannot experience another like erection and orgasm. And again, when you're young, this can be very, very like brief. But when you're older, it can be quite a long length of time, um, just due to age and how long it takes your body to get that blood flow back. So um, kind of an interesting thing that we notice in men, but not in women. And again, there are a lot of differences in the way that men and women respond sexually. And I will never forget this. In my, the back of my mind, every time I see this picture, I had a young man like raise his hand like 10 years ago or eight years ago. And he's all like, yeah, I can tell which one is women because it's the complicated one on the bottom, right? <laughs> and I will never forget that. Like, he's all like, that just makes so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> Laughed in my head, right? Um, but there's so much more variability in women than there is in men. <clears throat> men tend to follow a very distinct pattern when it comes to their arousal and their sexual response. They build, they plateau, they peak. And then they have that resolution and refractory period. And then depending on age, they might be able to go again, but they're separate events in a sense, right? Because of that refractory period. Women, on the other hand, as my students said, complicated, right? Um, women just have a, a more variety in the way that they can respond. So you see like this one here kind of follows the typical pattern, right? Of like building and then plateau um, orgasm, maybe even another orgasm. Right. Another one you get here is somebody doesn't orgasm. They just have like a lot of little plateaus, but never reach um, climax. And then uh, this one, I don't know, we go up and then way down. Right. Uh, so it's interesting how women tend to have a whole lot of variety. And this can cause problems between men and women when they're having sex. 
right? And just looking at the picture, you can see that, I would assume. Um, some of you are, are nodding, um, but it can cause issues, right? Because men tend to be much quicker in the way that they like uh, become aroused, reach orgasm, um, and then fall down versus women can oftentimes take a little bit longer to um, get turned on and uh, tend to be in plateau a little bit longer. So uh, women can experience multiple orgasms. It's at least possible versus men cannot because of that refractory period. Now, again, it might be like minutes in between when they're younger, so it can appear that way, but they are considered to be a sexual or a, a separate sexual response cycle. Um, any questions or, or anything with this? I have a, a like, there was a, a comedian who like, I showed you one of his clips earlier, but he made a joke about this too that I thought was funny and I'll play it for you, but any thoughts or questions or anything? Okay. Um, let me play this for you. <clears throat> Pockets, right. Again, there are kind of well-documented differences between the ways that men and women respond. And that can sometimes be a little bit problematic, right? When um, somebody takes a little bit longer to reach arousal and somebody else is there instantly, that can sometimes cause some issues. So I think being aware of this is helpful. Um, and again, knowing that there's so much more variety in women than there stereotypically tends to be in men. Uh, some sexual behaviors, right? So this uh, the book goes into a bunch of different behaviors. There's a lot of uh, very uh, interesting images in there too, which you can enjoy uh, if you have read the chapter or looking at it. Uh, but it talks about a bunch of different behaviors, one of them being celibacy. And celibacy is interesting because it used to be defined historically as not being married, right? Like if you weren't married, of course, you weren't engaging in sex because you didn't have sex before marriage. A little bit different now. We um, tend to talk about celibacy as either complete celibacy or partial celibacy. Someone who has complete celibacy, right, they're completely celibate, uh, doesn't engage in any kind of sexual activity alone or with others. There's no masturbating. There's no um, sexual contact with other people. That would be a complete choice, right, where you don't engage in anything sexual whatsoever. Partial celibacy is much more common, but this might be somebody who decides like, okay, I'm going to engage in like uh, masturbation and I'll like have some degree of touch that's allowed, but I'm not going to engage in any kind of intercourse, uh, maybe until I'm married or until I meet the right person, whatever um, their choices that they're making. And there's a lot of reasons for why someone might decide to be celibate, right? Religion is probably the biggest one, right? A lot of religions uh, believe in waiting until you're married to have sex, right? Uh, my brother is deeply Mormon. That's a huge part of like his belief system was waiting until he was married to have sex with his wife. Uh, might be moral beliefs that you have, waiting for the right person. A lot of people will wait till they meet somebody that they're in love with or like plans to stay with. Uh, maybe you want to focus on other things instead, right? Or it has to do with health and fears of STDs or STIs. So there's a lot of reasons why someone might choose this, but this is one sexual behavior, right? Or we could say lack of sexual behavior, maybe, um, that people are choosing what level of sexuality to engage in, which we would call celibacy or partial celibacy. Sexual dreams and fantasies um, are a big part of sexual behavior for people. Uh, mental experiences, right? These are like the thoughts and dreams and fantasies that you have in your mind. And these can play a huge role in sex, right? People's mental state can matter quite a bit, right? For some people, when they're stressed, sex is the last thing that is on their mind. And for other people, when they're stressed, this might be something that like is a good release for them. And so oftentimes people will engage in like dreams and fantasies all kind of all over the board as to uh, whether or not it's considered cheating or not, kind of like we were talking about with the film last time, like if you have a fantasy about somebody else, is that cheating or not? Depends on the person. I'm sure you can guess what my opinion on that would be. I would say yes, <laughs> but uh, you know, it really depends. But the function of these is that they tend to have a big role in pleasure and arousal. And oftentimes people can engage in some of these fantasies as like a role play with a partner. And that might be a safe way to kind of, um, you know, incorporate these things into their activities. It can help to overcome sexual anxiety. A lot of people, when they're uh, thinking about being intimate with somebody for the first time, might kind of play it out in their mind as a way to prepare for it or be excited about it and think about it. 
uh, it's considered a more acceptable expression of behavior, right? Like maybe sometimes people will fantasize about something that isn't necessarily acceptable to do. Um, and we'll talk about some of those kind of less acceptable behaviors uh, later in the semester, but maybe it's something that they have a fetish for and their partner doesn't, right? And so they fantasize about it as a way to get some of that without having to seek it from a partner. So fantasies and dreams can play a huge role in somebody's level of arousal and sexual behaviors. Uh, masturbation, right? Another one here, right? And uh, oh, it's been way too long since we've done slang. I think this is like our last opportunity for slang here, right? So I want you to find a couple of people around you and write it down because I hope you'll share. Uh, but I want you to come up with all of the terms you can, slang terms you can see for masturbating, right? Uh, write them down. I should have told you to think about this when I saw you the other day, right? Uh, but Go ahead and uh, take a few minutes, write it down so that you can share, but find a few people, write down all the slang terms you can come up with for masturbating. <laughs> Yeah, write it down. <laughs> You should will him to write it down. <laughs> you will write this down. Seriously though, I love it. I Come on. I got here on time, but I didn't want to walk in by myself. I was the you made a whole, you made a whole sentence out of that. Green, popping the carrot. I'm not sure. You over there? I brought candy. Let's go. More than five. It's totally acceptable. Then. I think there's definitely more slang for parents. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 oh, no. Making the ball. Oh, no. Making the ball. Boxing the iron. iron shield. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're writing these down. <laughs> I actually say something along these lines. <laughs> No one says that except you. Hey, you just don't go to the You just don't go to the sport. You just don't go to the I'm going to use that one. I'm going to use that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Making waffles. What? Making waffles. I don't get that one. Do we need to use that? Do we need to make that? Making waffles. What? Shutting the door. 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 Sh
Sad you have to eat like six of them. Right? Like, six six of them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. 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 I Speak in the pinky snake. I'm like, I'm like, all right have we uh have we exhausted this could be a this could be one that goes on <laughs> For this, yes, I'm. I'm ready. Here we go. Okay, we'll go here and then we'll go over there. All right. I love that you like stretched for that. You were ready. You're like, let's do or, this. Uh, <laughs> one after the. All right, let's do it. Wicked bean jacking off, jerking off, beating your meat, cranking the hog, white, stuffing the carrot, petting the cat, charming the snake, lone ranger in, talking the squirt gun, busting a nut, digging for clams, digging for gold. Shucking the oyster and slugging the sister. Okay. All right. So, I love it. All right. Do you want to read yours? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Here we go. All right. Scratching Yoda behind the ears, looking <laughs> the bean, jacking off, jerking off, wanking, beating the meat, poaching the egg, shaking hands with the milkman, polishing the banister, boxing the one eyed champ, visiting the safety box, finding Nemo, dialing the <laughs> uh, turning on the sprinklers, downstairs DJ, getting the pinky stinky. Muffin, uh, muffin, and parting the red seat. Okay. All right. <laughs> Next time somebody asks you if you like Finding Nemo, now you have to clarify, right? Like the movie? Or what are we talking about? Yeah. Okay, go for it. Even if it's overlap, don't worry about it. Practicing self abuse, practicing self abuse. Touch yourself, poaching the egg, shaking hands with the milkman, eat your meat, double clicking, polishing the banister, charming the snake, finding Nemo, turning on the sprinklers, shucking the corns, DIY, <laughs> spearing the beard, uh, yeah, spearing the beard with clam, scratching Yoda behind the ears. I knew you guys would like that one. <laughs> Petting the kitten, blowing your own horn, spanking the monkey. Monkey blasting off, milking the cow, two-finger tango. Well, right? These are these are involved, right? Uh, do you notice, and I heard a couple of groups say this, there are so many more for men than there are for women, right? And that uh, is often the case because we typically talk about men with masturbating, though it can be anybody, obviously. Uh, anybody else? I don't want to rob you of your chance to uh, share your list. Anyone over here? I feel like you're, you're pretty much exhausted, right? Uh, there are so many slang terms for masturbating, right? And masturbating or masturbation, right? So stimulating your own genitals, right? For sexual pleasure uh, is something that has traditionally 
been condemned, right? Uh, especially when we look at the role of religion, right? Oftentimes religion um, condemns things like masturbating, right? Um, and this is something that a lot of people engage in, right? What, did, what was that quote that we saw earlier? 90% of men masturbate and the rest lie, right? Um, it's something like it's something that a lot of people do, right? And sometimes we call this uh, manual sex, but it's usually called masturbating. Uh, so again, re religious like things have often played a huge role in this. And so there was a lot of interesting stuff that happened in terms of diet. Um, and we talked about this way back on that little quiz I gave you on like day two, uh, cornflakes and graham crackers, which are both very bland foods, maybe not the cinnamon graham crackers or like the chocolate graham crackers, but like the old school traditional graham cracker was actually developed to try try and curb people from masturbating. So it was thought that if people had a bland diet, that they would be less interested in sex. And again, that's where the idea of aphrodisiacs came from as a counter to that. But cornflakes and uh, graham crackers were developed to stifle masturbation, right? It's something to think about next time you're having either. Um, now, again, if you're having a s'more with all of the sugar in there, like that's not going to work, right? Um, and it doesn't work, but that was the thought at the time and that people who were wealthy or had access to more rich ingredients um, were stereotypically like engaging in things that were aphrodisiac qualities. So uh, we have a lot of like erroneous health concerns about this. There's the, all the myths of masturbating. Like if you masturbate, you'll get hairy palms and you'll go blind and all these things that can happen. Like a lot of like very like off stereotypes and health concerns with this. It's not something that's considered to be harmful in any way, but it can get in the way at times. There are, are circumstances where it could be problematic. Like if you are masturbating so much that you reduce your sensitivity, it can make it more difficult to reach orgasm with a partner, right? Um, so you can, in a sense, you can't like um, vibrate something off, like it's another stereotype, but you could get so used to something like a vibrator that somebody's manual like stimulation of, of you might not achieve the same end, if that makes sense. So it's not necessarily harmful, but it could be something that gets in the way. Uh, the number one reason that people masturbate is to relieve tension, right? And I put it in bold here, like in case I were to ask you that, but that's the number one reason that people tend to masturbate or maybe to help counter um, different sex drives. It's very common that partners might have different levels of interest in sex. Right. And so oftentimes as a way of dealing with that, people will engage in things like masturbating, right, in order to help get through like the gaps and like the differences in their sex drive. Uh, maybe it's a way to relax and help fall asleep. Uh, maybe it's just for pleasure. Right. Or um, to engage in some kind of variety that maybe a partner isn't interested in. But tension is really the number one reason to release or relieve tension. Kissing and touching, obviously huge parts of sexual behavior. Uh, kissing's an interesting one. The Kama Sutra talks about like 32 different types of kisses that you can engage in, right? Um, but this is something that um, has very different attitudes around the world, right? Different attitudes about like the importance and role of kissing, but it is something that plays a big role um, in arousal for people and in sexual behaviors. Uh, I found a whole montage of people kissing. Do you want to watch it or does that just sound awful? I got one nod. Okay, we'll do it. That's all I needed. Okay, really um, a big part of like sexual behavior, right? Of um, any kind of intimacy and really interesting, as I said, uh, it's kind of funny, the like the Kama Sutra, like all these diagrams of different kisses, right? Kissing being something that is a very common sexual behavior along with touching, right? We talked about the role of these erogenous zones that we have on our body. Right, that the whole body can be responsive and that you can condition somebody uh, to have responses right in places that aren't naturally like uh, arousing or erogenous and kind of the cornerstone of, of sexuality, right? Touch is a big, big part of that, releasing a lot of hormones and neurotransmitters um, when we engage in sexual behaviors. Um, a couple other things um, here, oral sex, right? Oral genital stimulation. Your book has a lot of images of this um, in there. Um, I picked one of them, but uh, cunnilingus and fellatio, words that we very rarely use, but those are the technical terms for oral sex. Um, cunnilingus would be 
oral stimulation of like female genitalia, the vulva, the clitoris, the labia. Uh, fellatio would be oral stimulation of the penis or scrotum. Uh, so cunnilingus and fellatio or like oral sex. Uh, a lot of mixed attitudes about oral sex. It's a very common sexual behavior. It tends to be one of the ones that people engage in like earlier rather than like intercourse, right? It tends to be one of the like early forms of intimacy that people engage in. But a lot of people have qualms about it, right? Like um, insecurities about it or maybe discomfort with the idea um, that maybe, you know, that there might be like smell or taste or that it's unattractive or that it's too vulnerable. There's a lot of negative attitudes, but it's very, very common, uh, very common sexual behavior. We talked about this earlier in the semester when we were talking about male anatomy, that the things that a person puts into their body can affect the taste of their like ejaculate in a sense, both for men and for women, but we stereotypically talk about this for men. Um, so things that are like traditionally unhealthy for you, um, like different substances like alcohol and different drugs and so on. Uh, but you can very much um, alter your taste of your ejaculate by the things you put in your body. It takes about 24 to 48 hours for that to happen, uh, but it is definitely something um, that is well documented. So a lot of mixed um, attitudes again, on this, but a very common sexual behavior. Uh, less common, but still something that we talk about, anal stimulation or anal sex. Now, this is probably one of the most dangerous sexual activities that you can engage in. And the reason for that um, is the anus is um, an area of the body that is very vulnerable to tears, okay? And, and like slight tears. So we're talking about like microscopic little openings because things are exiting the body through the anal opening, right? This is where we eliminate waste. And so what can happen is this is a very like area that's very prone to infection. And so you have to practice a lot of like care when you're engaging in any kind of like anal stimulation, right? And you'll also notice that any kind of toy or item that is used for anal sex has a very wide base to it, okay? And so like these are like common like, um, like toys that are used for like anal stimulation. And notice how they all have like a grip or a base at the bottom. Now the anus has very, very powerful muscles. And so if you're not careful, uh, sometimes people run into issues where things get like sucked up into their body and they have to go to the emergency room for something very embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> you just look so mortified. Can you imagine that um, hospital visit, right? Um, and you hear about this, and it's uh, probably ridiculously embarrassing, but like things like anal beads and anal toys have strong bases to them so that that doesn't happen. But it's very, very important when you're engaging in this kind of behavior uh, to have like lubricants, right? Or to be clean, right? Um, this is something that can be more dangerous just because of the nature of that area of the body. Um, there is something called analingus, sometimes called rimming, uh, where people will orally stimulate the anus. Again, even more so there, important to have like cleanliness because of the bacteria that could be present. Uh, so there are a lot of nerve endings in this part of the body. So it is a part of the body that can be very arousing, but very mixed attitudes on this, right? Uh, this is something that um, I think people are very divided on. They either are interested in it or not. But just uh, be aware that there are a lot of health risks with anal stimulation. And it's something you have to be careful with because of the small tears and bacteria that can occur in that part of the body. Any uh, questions, thoughts on comments? Anything so far? It doesn't necessarily have to be this one, but I don't know why they're all purple. I was just noticing that. They're all purple here, right? Uh, that wasn't intentional, right? Um, intercourse, right? Uh, and I've mentioned this term a few times before, oftentimes called coitus, right? And again, not a term that we use very often, but that's the technical term for like penis entering vagina. We call that coitus. Uh, it's what we think of when we think of sex. You're like the, the horoscopes over here, right? Uh, you can see your uh, astrological sign and position that goes with it. Uh, an incredible amount of variety here as well. Like the stereotype is the old like missionary position. 
definition of man and woman, but there are an incredible amount of different positions. You're welcome for the pictures up here. Uh, there's a lot of feet on that, like going on on these images here. But uh, again, an incredible amount of variety. This is like the stereotype when we think of sex, right, uh, is coitus, right? But um, again, there can be an incredible amount of other behaviors as we're talking about today that tend to go with this act. All right. Um, oh, I had a I had a video here. Um, interesting. Like I was looking up stuff for this, and we were talking about sexual behaviors, and sometimes the role of expectation versus reality. I forget where I saw this, but I'll play it for you. Uh, it was like a commercial for something in your mind, right? Um, and so it's so much of that, right? Um, that I don't think that things like pornography help with those stereotypes and expectations. Oftentimes, portraying like sex very inaccurately or in a way that doesn't match like the average um, person. Um, I put some like same sex sexual behaviors up here. The book talks about these as well. Obviously a lot of similarities to like heterosexual sexual behaviors, um, but there's oftentimes a lot more like oral and manual sex. Manual sex would be like using your hands um, instead of um, like obviously like a penis into a vagina, uh, a lot of sex toys being used like vibrators or dildos or strap-ons or um, the anal toys and things like we just looked at. But um, a lot of different behaviors practiced between like two men or two women. Um, here are some of like the common ones um, that the book talks about things like fisting. Um, and this will come up again when we get to talking about pornography, something that you actually can't portray in pornography. Um, it's considered a violation of the code of what's allowed and not. But fisting would be inserting your fist into the anus or vagina, um, so your entire hand um, into somebody's body. Uh, Interfemoral intercourse, um, so thrusting the penis between the thighs of a partner. Um, so obviously, if we have like two men, for example, that might be something that's more common or something called um, like the talkery, like is another one that we sometimes talk about between two men, between two women, um, tribadism, right? Uh, so rubbing your vulva against another woman's vulva is another behavior that um, is sometimes done. And uh, the talk book talks a little bit too about lesbian erotic role identification, uh, something that I think is getting a little less common than it used to be. It used to be pretty common, um, especially between two women, that you would have one who's maybe like more masculine and one who's more feminine. Um, I think that dichotomy has kind of shifted quite a bit over the last like 20 years, but it's still something that you sometimes see in relationships where you'll have a dominant and a submissive or like a masculine and a feminine um, like partner. But a lot of like very um, different sexual behaviors between two men or two women. And again, some overlap as well between things that you might see between a man and a woman. Right. So um, some variety, but then a lot of like consistency as well. And then uh, one last interesting thing that the book talked about um, is tantric intercourse. And uh, I had the opportunity to take a really interesting class um, when I was in graduate school. It was a one unit class on tantric sex. Um, and like I got a, I have a minor in like sexuality and sex studies uh, and gender studies and like women's study. I have like six or seven minors. I didn't want to leave college ever. Like I loved college so much. See, and I didn't leave. I'm still here, right? Even if I'm not on that side. Uh, but tantric intercourse is something that's really interesting. It's like a spiritual element of sexuality. And this is something that isn't talked about a lot, but a lot of cultures, as we talked about way back in chapter one, believe in like the spirituality piece of sexuality. That's um, sex between two people can be a joining of like sexual energy and spiritual energy as much as it can be a physical act. So looking at the emotional and physical elements of sexuality here as well, almost like a control and delay of orgasm where you're focusing on a connection with a partner. So oftentimes tantric intercourse involves a lot of like spiritual connection with another person. And like very slow, like prolonging an orgasm and prolonging the sexual experience to have harmony and connection with another person, right? And so it's a lot of like making sure you're in tune with somebody else and not rushing through sex, but having it be like a long, slow, um, like spiritual process, as well as like a physical one as well. So just kind of an interesting uh, 
interesting side notes. Um, and again, the book talks about a bunch of other behaviors. Those are all a lot of them uh, that we kind of went through a little bit quickly because there's so many of them. But there's an incredible amount of variety when it comes to sexuality. And we'll talk about that a little more when we get to the um, the topic kind of toward the end of like looking at paraphilias and fetishes and, and things along along those lines. So uh, a couple of quick uh, reminders in my last few minutes that I have with you here. Uh, don't forget that on Monday, I won't see you, right? Which is sad because it's the day before Halloween and I want to see you. But um, on Monday, you have your exam, right? So exam number two, please don't forget to take that. I will send out a message Sunday night as a reminder that you don't have class Monday morning. But remember that that is on Monday. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful Halloween. Thank you. I love I love that you dressed up. Like those are like serious like lightsabers too. Like you have like, some lightsaber energy. I have like a plastic one, right? That's not so fun. Uh, but I hope you all have a wonderful holiday if you celebrate. I have some more candy here if you want more on your way out. Have a wonderful weekend. Be safe. I'll see you all uh, next week. And good luck on the exam, of course, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay.